we're going to pick up where we left off last week, where Jesus was giving the parable, uh, two parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Remember the context. So important to remember what he was teaching on. Um, because he had people complaining that he was sitting with tax collectors and sinners who were being drawn to him. And they're like, what's this guy doing sitting with these people that sh we shouldn't be associating with? And he's saying, you're missing the whole point. The Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. This is what the Father wants me to be doing. This is what you, the Pharisees, should have been doing, and you didn't do that. And now you're criticizing me for bringing these people close to God. Jesus never condoned sin. If he sat with them, he wasn't joining in. He was leading them away from it and bringing them to the Father. And so he gave those two parables to teach them about the heart of God the love of God for the lost, the value of the lost soul, every soul, mainly the image and likeness of God, the destiny of every soul, and how important it is for us to be reminded of that, that every human being will live forever somewhere, and that God has put a premium on the human soul, mainly the image and likeness of God. And Jesus knew that. We're supposed to know that and have that motivate us when we're dealing with the lost, to care for them, to love them, to bring them to Christ and be a part of that, and also to care for those who are backslidden, those who are, out, who are outside of the will of God. Again, never to condone sin, but to have a heart for them to bring them back to God, which is why he gave the next story, which is what's called the story of the prodigal son. It's in connection to the two other stories. Now, before we dive into it, um, it revolves around three people, a father and two sons. Um, it's regarded by some literary critics as one of the, the, the greatest short stories ever because of its impact, its timing. Every time you read it, you learn something about the heart of God. You learn something about yourself in here. And um, it, it always has an impact on me personally. So no matter where you are in your walk with the Lord, this story will have an impact on you. And I encourage you, as you're reading this this morning, uh, as we study it, let the Lord speak to your heart. Because he's sitting there with people who are very religious. And again, they're criticizing him. And so he tells a story that they understood in culture about how a young man wanted his inheritance before his father died. So let's read verse 11 through... 12, to begin with. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. The father normally, normally would die before an inheritance was given to his children. There were occasions when a father could be, as strange as it sounds, bought out in an inheritance, or the desire could be, before you die, let me have what's coming to me now, as in the case here we read about. So this was not unfamiliar. The inheritance would be divided primarily between the children, the sons. The firstborn would get the greater portion. That was an Old Testament command. He would he'd be given the double portion. Not just because God simply loves the firstborn more. So if you're a firstborn, you're thinking, like, of course he loves me more. I'm the firstborn, right? I'm the greatest. Well, that's not why. Oftentimes, you're the first pancake. And some of you parents know what that's what we're talking about. You might burn it a little bit before you get the other ones right. But it's because they were given the most responsibility. It also spoke about the firstborn Christ, who would have the authority over his whole family that he would bring in through his work on the cross. We're all a part of Jesus' inheritance that he gets from the Father. It has so many meanings to it. In this case, a younger, a younger brother goes to the Father. Not the older brother. The younger brother goes to the Father and says, 
give me what's coming to me. If you are to boil down and sum up what he's saying, I want what's coming to me now. I don't want you, I want what's yours. I don't want to wait until you die, but I kind of wish you were dead so I could have my life now. This is what he's asking for. I want my freedom. I want to go on my own path. I want my own life apart from your influence and your relationships. I want my own way. We all know the famous song by Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. To be warned for anybody who wants their own way apart from God, even the skeptic Thomas Huxley, who is known as Darwin's bulldog, an atheist, said that a man's worst difficulties begin when he's able to do just as he likes. This young man is about to experience that. I want to do what I want to do with the resources that are coming to me from you, by the way. Thank you. I don't want you to tell me what to do anymore. How many of us have learned by experience that that is true in our own life? Or you know somebody who's going through this, maybe in your own family or a friend, and so you look at that and you think, oh boy. And I believe, even though it's not written in the text here, the father said, oh son. But it says that he divided to them his livelihood. And this shows not the leniency of the father or the indulgence of the father, as some might say it, because there's no criticism here of Jesus towards the father, but the love of the father to allow his son to choose his own path. There's a respect in the sense for his will, not the choice that he makes, but for the right to choose. Remember, even in the beginning, the father gave man a will to choose. And so he took it, and he left. This is a familiar story. And so many of us know this already. And Jesus is telling this story, and these Pharisees understood this, that there are people who are only going to learn, if they're going to learn, the hard way. Yet, this father will leave the light on for the son. What do I mean by that? There used to be an old motel chain. I don't know if it's still around called Motel 6. There was a commercial for it. We're going to leave the light on for you. I like that. We're going to leave the light on for you whenever you come, right? And, and in that sense, the father is going to leave the light on for this son. When, whenever you decide to come home, I'll be here. And so the story goes on. He takes his journey. Verse 13. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The word prodigal basically means wasteful or being extravagant. Everything that had been given to him, he just wasted it. Verse 14, but when he spent all, there arose a severe famine in that, in that land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine had ate, and no one gave him anything. So he goes into this far country. We don't know where it is, far enough away from home. Um, when he left home, he left his community, he left, he left his friends, he left accountability, and we see immediately that he had no discipline in his life. He wasted everything on what? Pleasure. We don't know exactly what it was um, that he was wasting it on, but he was partying. Safe to say, you can use your imagination, right? He had this new freedom, a feeling of independence, of manliness, right? I'm on my own. New friendships, because if you have money and you're willing to spend it on people, you'll have friends. Different tastes, different experiences, even a level of popularity that maybe he didn't have before while his possessions lasted. But eventually, they run out, as in his case. He became broke. His resources are all gone. Uh, the, the Lord just knows the story. 
He wasted everything, all gone. And that means all of his friends that associated with him are also gone. They disappeared. And on top of that, a famine comes into the land. It's as if God, in his mercy, is allowing him to dry up. And then on top of it, he even sends some more heat. God does send famines. And in this case, a severe famine into the land. And he becomes a man who's in want or in desperation, driven by hunger and a need for covering basic necessities of life. He joined himself with a citizen of that country. The word there for joined means glued himself. He's in this relationship. It would be an unequally yoked, ungodly relationship with a Gentile, a horrible position for a Jew to be in. He would have never have done this. He's a day laborer. The guy sends him into the field. I'll pay you per diem. He's the lowest of the servants of that citizen that he's glued to. He's feeding pigs. Again, to a Jew, that was bad, not kosher, unclean. And here he is in the slop of a pig pen feeding animals wishing he could eat what they ate. And Jesus says, and nobody gave him anything. No more handouts, buddy. Where are your friends that you spent all your money on? Nobody gave him anything. Why? They didn't care. We learned the hard way that the world is cold. Not even the pigs. Oink, oink, get out of here. It's my pod. So sad, right, that just maybe a few months earlier, he had friends. He had people who really loved him, whether he really understood it or not, especially his dad, especially the father. I remember last week, that one verse in the Psalms, as a father pities his son, so the Lord has mercy on those who fear him. Just that father heart towards his son. He found out the hard way that sin promises freedom but always brings slavery. Every time. When you reject God's way for enjoyment, you end up being a slave that money cannot buy meaning and true satisfaction. And if you want to find yourself apart from God, you will actually lose yourself. And you can lose your soul. And how many of us, even personally, have experienced that? Again, you see somebody going through that. And here, remember, the context is these Pharisees are looking at Jesus like, what are you doing with these people? He's saying, well, let me share about the heart of the Father and these people that you're disdaining and my ministry to them. They are like that prodigal. And I'm going to tell you about real repentance, what God's able to do with repentance and the heart of the Father towards anybody, anybody who would come back to him. It says about repentance that he eventually came to himself. Look at verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I perish with hunger. He came to himself. It means he began to think clearly, reason. It's the blunt edge of life just just sometimes breaks you that sharp edge of reality that cuts into you. And you start to think through the pain, through the deprivation, about how good it was. I remember the first time I moved out of my house. And in a year, I wanted to move back. I was like, man, this is really hard. I have to pay for everything, cook for, cook for myself. and It's kind of uncomfortable. And you start thinking how good it was. I had absolutely no reason to move out. Just wanted my freedom, wanted to go out. And then you think how good it was in your father's house, in your mother's house with your parents, right? I didn't have to go to this extent, okay, where 
I'm, I'm hitting the rock bottom place that this young man hit. But this is something that God does use in, in people's lives where you come to that place of reason. And he says, you come to yourself. What, what does he mean by that? Well, who you were in your identity to your father was submerged in your sin. You walked away from your family. You walked away from, from what your father, in this case, this young man's father, gave to him and wanted him to be for a life of rebellion and independence. That's not who you are. That's not who you're created to be. A human being is made in the image and likeness of God. Satan would love to just take that image and destroy it. And what God will do is, through difficulty, through brokenness, bring you to yourself where you realize, is this who I am? Why am I here again? Who is God? I want to know him. Who did he make me to be? And, and not only that, you realize, I brought this upon myself. I've actually sinned. I'm not blaming somebody else for my own difficulty in life. This is all because of me. I did this. We understand that there could be family situations that, yes, there's brokenness that comes into your life, certainly because of an environment, and, and we're not discounting that at all. But when a person is genuinely coming to themselves, in that place where there's real repentance, they own their own sin, and they don't blame shift. This is what he begins to do. Listen to what he says. First of all, he realizes how good it was in the father's house. He also realizes that it's needless for me to be perishing. I don't have to be here anymore. He knows something about his father that says, I can go home. I can go back to him. And so in verse 18, he says, I will arise and go to my father and will say, now here's where it gets difficult, but this is necessary. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. These are the steps of genuine repentance. The first thing he does is he has that blessed poverty of spirit where he recognized, I sinned. This is where Jesus said, blessed are the poor of spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I see that I have done this. I have sinned against heaven. I have sinned against my Father. That's confession. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But then there's also going. He could have sit there, sat there and just been sorry and said it to himself. Maybe even said it to God. But real repentance looks like something. You have to actually get up and go back to that place that you left. In this case, it was home. The steps of real repentance that lead a person to salvation or the backslider back to God is conviction of sin. This is what God does to us. He brings conviction. I know that I've done this. These things. I know that I'm like this. It's not his fault or her fault, their fault. I'm owning this. I brought myself to this place. It was my rebellion. It was my decision. My greed. Give me. Give me. I want, and I was wrong, and I sinned, and now I'm going back. And you could tell that it was real because he said, I'm going to say, make me. No longer does he say, give me. Now he says, I want you to make me. I want you to shape my life. And I'm even willing to take that place of a servant in your home. It's better to be a servant in your home than to be out here with these friends, with this citizen, could care less about me. That's real repentance. And so he goes home. And as he's going back, we see that the light is still on. Remember, I said earlier on that the light is left on by this father. Here, go take it. Go ahead. And, and then the father's heart would be broken, praying for his son. 
not knowing where he was. No phones then. Couldn't track anybody. He was just, Lord, he's, he's in your hands. But he's looking and he's waiting for him. Because we see what happens when the father sees his son. It says in verse 20, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. This means he was looking for him. What does this speak to us about the father in heaven? That he's watching. Watching and waiting for that person to come back to him. Longing for them to return. It says when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Again, that pity, that mercy, that mercy for his son to return. This is the heart of the father. For who? For this younger son who was greedy, who spent everything that the father had worked for and saved for and handed to him, and the father still loved him, knowing that when he saw him, he had nothing. What did he look like? Rags? Filth, disheveled, broken. He didn't take a shower and clean up before he came home. He has no shoes on his feet. He's barely clothed. Yet the father has compassion on his son. And as he has compassion, he ran. Now, this was, this was unusual because a father would never run to a son in that culture. They would never lower themselves to run to the son. They'd wait for the son to come to them. It's his problem, his fault. He has to come to me. I'm the greater of the two. And even though the father, of course, is the greater in the relationship, he's still running to him. And this, again, Jesus is saying, this is the father. Towards any soul that would come home to him. He runs to him, fell on his neck, and he kissed him. And this is in public. The family's watching this. The servants are watching this. And his love for his son is so great that he doesn't care about what people think. I just want you home. And in verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. You see, it wasn't something just that he privately did when he was at that lowest part in his life. He followed through and he said this to the father. So important to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to repent. I'm going to say this to him and confess. And he owned his unworthiness. But the father said to his servants, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. This is the heart of the father. He sees the son. He has compassion on the son. He runs to the son. He falls on the son. He's kissing his son, shamelessly loving his son, welcoming him home because he cares. It's his boy. And then he says, take the best robe. Who had the best robe in the house? Him. That was his robe. In other words, I want him to have my own covering. This is speak to us about God's best, his own righteousness. What covers us in our nakedness, our spiritual uncleanness, the righteousness of Christ? That is the best robe. Put a ring on his finger. The ring spoke about authority. He's not going to be a servant. He's my son. In John chapter 1 John said he gives the authority, the right to be called the sons of God to everybody who believes in his name. We have his righteousness. We have his ring. He puts shoes on his feet saying he's not going to be the lowest of the low. He's back in the family. It's interesting. He didn't earn his way back. He just showed up. But because he has confessed his sin, he's repented, he's back in good standing with his father, so much so that he actually killed the fatted calf. That's where that comes from. We're having a party. He doesn't chasten him. He doesn't send him to his room. To strip him of all dignity. You're back in fellowship with me. And everybody's going to know it. And this is what Jesus was saying about the lost sheep and the lost coin. I am rejoicing because my son that was lost, that was dead, is found and is alive again. There's no greater joy to the father And remember, he's responding to the complaint of these Pharisees, these legalists who had empty religion that didn't do anything for anybody. 
So many people had left Judaism in that day and went out into the world because it was empty. And it doesn't excuse their sin, but it was lifeless. And here they are, lifeless and loveless, complaining about Christ. He's saying, you don't know the heart of the Father and how God can forgive sins and loves to forgive sins. If a person would repent, even the most wicked of people, if they'll come to him. There's a story about a, a, a wicked man. He was a medical doctor in England. His name was Dr. Bland. In his day, people knew him to be an evil man, godless. But as he came near to death, he was troubled. So he called for a preacher. Tell me something before I die. And a liberal preacher came to him. What I mean by liberal is they didn't really believe the Bible to be the word of God. They didn't really have much to say. So he came to try and give him some words of comfort. But he, as bad as he was, he could tell this person's a phony, and he threw him out. Get out of here. Bring me somebody who actually believes the Bible, somebody who actually knows the God that they claim to know. And so another preacher came. He shared the truth. He shared the love of God. And Dr. Bland repented before he died. He gave his heart to Christ. And when the other preacher, the liberal minister, talked to the believer, because he was telling him, well, Dr. Bland repented. He said, you didn't do that for me. He threw me out. Oh, he, well, you didn't have the truth. You don't believe the truth. And so the liberal preacher said, are you telling me that that guy who did all these bad things by confession, a deathbed confession, that that's enough to atone for all of his sins, for all of his evil? And the other preacher said, no, but Calvary is. Calvary is enough to do that if you believe it. And here's the thing. Jesus is saying the Father has sent the Son into the world to forgive all manner of sin, if you believe that, for anybody. Dr. Bland, a backslidden son, whoever it is. And God rejoices to bring people to himself. You think about the cost to Christ. He's, st he's sitting right there being criticized by these people. saying, you don't know why I came. You don't know the heart of God. I came to seek these people and to bring them home. And when you look at this story, we could all relate in some ways. First of all, all of us as believers are reminded that that love that God has for that prodigal is the same love that saved us. Same love that saved us. Whether you're walking with the Lord, you're backslidden maybe. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, you know, I'm outside of the will of God. God loves you. He cares for you as his children in a family, as sons, as brothers and sisters. You can look at your siblings. You can be teenagers. You can be adults, and you can have issues with other family members that aren't in fellowship with God. And we can see what our attitude should be towards them. And we can have hope that God can bring that brother or sister or cousin, whoever it is, back to himself. Because God sees them and he cares for them. And he allows for brokenness to come into their life. As parents, you can have a son or a daughter who's younger or who's older who's not walking with the Lord. And you can condemn yourself. I didn't do everything perfectly. Well, I'm sure you didn't. None of us do. It's interesting that in this passage, and again, we don't know this man. We, you know, it's most likely a parable, but it's based on a real story. These things really happen. There's no condemnation of the parent. God, who's the perfect father, has many prodigals. He never did anything wrong in his parenting. But they're out there. And God cares for your children. And he wants to give you hope. And sometimes it takes just time for them to come around. There's a young man, early 20s, young adult, big kid, a wrestler who decided to just kind of push his weight around the home. He said, you know, I don't want to listen to dad anymore. I'm just going to kind of do it my way. His dad said, well, you can't just do what you want here in our home. This is my home. This is a godly home. But the guy, the kid was just too big for his dad to handle too. Not only was he larger, he was a wrestler. So his dad said, well, look, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and send you to your room because you probably send me to my room at this point. But you can't stay here. You can't, it can't be your way and my way. 
So he said, fine. So I'm leaving. He said, well, okay. I'm going to take everything that I have. He says, okay. But what do you have? Well, I own this car. He said, actually, no, you don't. It's my car. I don't know. You've been using my car. Oh. We can leave that here. Well, I own this. And it actually turned out he didn't really own anything. He was living off his parents for years. So his dad said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you take the clothes that are on your back. Because basically, that's what you own. So go ahead. I'll give you some money for lunch for a couple of days. But you're going to have to figure this out. You're old enough to go, so go. And so he left. 30 minutes later, there was a knock on the door. Can I come home? You need to chuckle a little bit at that because sometimes it takes only 30 minutes for some to break. Even some of the biggest, toughest ones don't really like to go hungry or they realize it quicker. But sometimes it takes 30 days. Sometimes it takes 30 years. That story doesn't always happen. But there are times when you have to let somebody go. Like in the case of this prodigal, we don't know if it was, if it was months Exactly, but in time, he broke. In the case of a Jacob, it took years. Jacob lied. Jacob stole. Jacob's brother was going to kill him, his older brother. And when he left, all he had was a staff in his hand. And it took years for God to break that man. But eventually, in time, God wore him down. And this is what God does, because he loves us. By the way, in this story with that young adult, nobody gave him anything either to help him. Sometimes we need to let people just hit rock bottom and get to that point where they come to themselves. What happened to Jacob? Well, he finally met the Lord face to face, and they had a wrestling match. I guarantee you're not going to beat Jesus in a wrestling match. He has his ways of breaking us. Sometimes it's in the case of you're feeding pigs and you can't even eat the food that they're eating. Sometimes people desert you. Sometimes it's a physical affliction, like in the case of a Jacob, where Jesus touched his thigh and dislocated it. He walked with a limp for the rest of his life, but God got him. He confessed to God, I'm Jacob, I'm a liar, I'm a cheat. And it was then when God made him Israel, governed by God, prince of God. And God rejoiced in that. So when we look at this story, we're reminded of the sovereignty and the goodness of God, and the process of God, and the timing of God. It's not always the same with everybody, but the love of God and the ability of God to bring a person to that place of desperation where they call upon God. And that far country doesn't have to be a location. It could be a heart issue. You could be right in the midst of everybody who still loves you, but be in a far country, far away, just gone. But God knows. He's able to bring a famine into your life, an emptiness into your life, and a brokenness into your life, or whoever it is, to bring you back to himself. So you come to yourself, two reasons to say, what am I doing here? I don't have to be here. You don't have to be there. God's saying, you don't have to stay there, but that's your choice. The steps of repentance are humility, truth. I did this. Confession. I sinned. Repentance. I'm going back to him. Humility and a willingness to say, Lord, now you make me. Not give me anymore. You make me. That's what God desires here. And when that change is there, you are received. There is a celebration in heaven. All the angels, even if people around here don't get it, all the angels are like, that guy is in. That girl's back. Praise God. Now, there are Jacobs and there are Jonas. What do I mean by that? Well, not everybody is happy when people come back. So there was a, a Sunday school teacher, and she went over the story, read the whole thing, and we're going to finish this in a minute. And so she asked the class, she says, now, 
Does anybody know if there's anybody in this story that was not happy about the son coming home? And a little kid raised his hand. She says, Timmy, what's the answer? He said, the fatted calf was not happy. <laughs> she said, that's true, but that's not the answer. It's the older brother. Let's read the rest of the story. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field. What's he doing? He's working. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called to one of the servants and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come home. And because he's received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. What's the deal with this guy? Why so angry? We're going to see in a minute why he's so angry. But that word for anger means a settled anger. He'd been angry at his brother for years. But the temperature of the moment, like heat, has brought the sap to the surface here. That bitterness is angry. And who's Jesus talking to? The Pharisees. We're working in the field. Here we are. We're doing all these things. And you're sitting here with all these tax collectors and sinners. And what are you doing? Why are you so angry? Do we get angry when there's a celebration around somebody else, especially when you don't think they deserve it? Because you think you do. The older brother is actually the one who's outside of fellowship right now with the father. The father loves him. But he, in his own bitter envy, is about to be a party pooper. Let's read the rest of this, unfortunately. It's not going to work. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. This father loves him too. This is a father who goes to his sons. What are you doing? He's pleading with him. And so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Really? Never? And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Not even a goat. You, you kill a fatty calf for this guy. Look at what he says in verse 30. But as soon as this son of yours came, not my brother, who's devoured your livelihood with harlots. It doesn't say that he devoured it with harlots. That was a rumor. He put that in there, possibly. He says, but you killed the fatted calf for him. What was his problem? He was jealous. You ever do that for me? Not even a goat. You make steak and even buy me a Whopper at Burger King. What's the deal? I served. I worked. I, I never did those things. I never transgressed any of your commandments. Well, no, no man or woman has, has never transgressed any of the commandments of God. But he actually thinks that he is better than his younger brother. And to be clear, if you looked at the two, you'd be like, he's the better son. He's the one who's working. He's the one who's home. He's the one who would be obedient. But he's also self-righteous. His own worth is in what he does and does not do. And he's comparing himself to the one who has failed. And he's got his eyes off the father. And his heart is not in sync with the love of God. It's his own success. He doesn't deserve this. I deserve this. I'm better than him. I work for you. And there are the Pharisees right there that Jesus is pointing to. You think you're better than them? You think you never transgressed? You think you serve God faithfully all the time? You look like you do, but God knows your heart. And if you really love God, you would love me, and you'd love the fact that I'm with these people, bringing them back to God. There are some Christians today who are like that. 
And maybe some of them are even here this morning. You're thinking, I don't do, and I never did, and I do this, and I don't want to be around certain people, and I'm, how dare they be blessed when they don't deserve. We don't deserve anything, any of us, apart from God's grace that's good in our life. And listen, Jesus wasn't yelling at these people and saying, and you. He's saying to them, guys, that older son, he would have been a good boy, but he was in error because he wanted those things. You see, he had to give me too. But he wasn't saying, make me just a servant like the younger one after his brokenness experienced. Listen to what the, the father says to this son. It's interesting. He's pleading with him. He says, son, you are always with me. What does he tell him? To, to get rid of the bitterness and the envy. You got me. You're always with me. And Jesus would say to us, if you're jealous, if you're bitter, at God's blessing in somebody's life, you look at them, they do not deserve that. They deserve to go to hell. Well, I do in my own sin. They deserve chastisement. They deserve this. Well, that's up to God. But if God has blessed them and received them and forgiven them, they get God, so do you. So do I. Jesus is saying, you get me. I'm always with you. And all that I have is yours. What does the Father say to us? Everything that I have is to all of my kids. The Father's love is lavished upon every one of his children. It may not look the same in this life, but it is an absolute fact. He loves us all equally and extravagantly. Prodigal, in a sense, not in a bad way, but it would seem like a waste. How foreign is the Father's love to us that we would be called the children of God? All that I have is yours. Should be enough for us. Thank you. Whatever I have or don't have, if you want to give that person something else, you want to take care of that prodigal and have to kill the fatty calf, praise God. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. This is the heart of God. You can grow up in the church and never do anything wrong before people, but you know, you know, you're really saved. The Holy Spirit in your life has brought conviction to your, to your heart. You need to be forgiven because you've sinned too. Maybe you didn't go out and do all those crazy things, but you need repentance too. And apart from the grace of God, your works will not get you to heaven. You're saved by grace, not by works. You're saved by grace through faith, and that is not of yourself. It is the gift of God to every one of us. And right there, the ground is leveled. Lord, thank you that I am allowed to be in your family. Thank you that you brought that person back or that person in. Thank you, Lord. Praise God that they're home. If you say it's okay, then I say it's okay. That's a good standard. If you forgive them, I forgive them. If you brought them back in, then I want them back in. If you're celebrating, then I want to celebrate. You can't go wrong with that. If you're bitter, if you think you're better than, you earn more before the Father, God's warning you're being like that older brother and by the way, I think that younger brother might have actually become a better servant if the older brother stayed in that better than mindset. Because those who are forgiven much love much. He reminds us that the one son, the one true son of God was given for us, completely for us to be made right with the Father. And there he is, looking at these people who are self-righteous, legalistic, empty in their religion and lifeless. He's saying, 
You don't have to stay like that. All that God has is yours. But you too need to be right with God. And Jesus leaves the light on for them too. He leaves the light on for us. And being the master storyteller, he never finished the story. That's for them to finish and for us to finish too. Amen.